we did it. We found the most annoying Robin. Yes, we were looking. Although this is actually not Robin, but as stated numerous times in that opening clip, Larry, or more accurately, Noziar Kid, which is Dick Grayson backwards. This character is a takeoff in Mr. Mitzla Pitlick and Batmite. The concept of imps from the fifth dimension bothering the world's finest, both individually and at times together, worked well for Superman and Batman, and each character brought a slightly different flavor to the same concept. But does it work with Larry when applied to Robin in the Teen Titans animated series? I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and it's time to get Fractured. Fractured is the 11th episode of the second season of the animated Teen Titans series, which initially ran from 2003 to 2006. This episode first aired August 7, 2004, and was written by David Slack and directed by Michael Chang. This episode stands out in its placement in season two, which overall was an adaptation of one of the most remembered Teen Titans arcs from the new Teen Titans era. It's known as a very impactful storyline, and that is the Judas Contract, which is from the Marv Wolfman and George Perez run in the 80s. The storyline was originally printed in Tales of the Teen Titans 42 to 44, and Tales of the Teen Titans Annual number three. To cliff notes and loosely define it, it can be said that one of its prominent elements involves the betrayal of the Teen Titans. This after they're infiltrated. There's a traitor in their midst in the form of Terra, who was working with Deathstroke. This was also the arc where Dick Grayson became Nightwing. This animated adaptation makes some modifications. Some are more obvious, such as the removal of the sexual relationship between Deathstroke and Terra, or Slade as he's called in the Teen Titans. A lot of Slade's backstory is gone, his wife, his son, Jericho, because this arc also introduced him. Ex-wife, I should say. That makes sense though, because this show was trying to keep things very archetypal, going so far as to not have the Titans seem to have civilian identities. So the villains also didn't have complex backstories. But the most notable change that the animated series brings is how sympathetic from the outset it makes Terra. She's less villainous here. She's certainly not enjoying her betrayal as much as she is at points in the comics. And she's certainly not the one holding the reins, which is how they play it at points. Here it's quite clear that she's being manipulated. Lack control, Terra. And when you lose control, you are more dangerous than anything I've ever seen. Now all this is relevant to mention because Fractured is kind of a breather episode. It takes place in between the reveal of Terra's betrayal and the fallout from it, which begins in episode 12 entitled Aftershocks part one. So if one is watching in order, this is a bit of a break in between some of the more emotionally fraught or potentially resonant episodes. Your miles will vary as to whether or not it's a welcome one. Also, it's a different experience just watching it on its own or out of order. So you need to examine it through a couple of angles. One is a filler episode in that place and also as its own episode on its own merits as always. It opens with a motorcycle chase with Robin chasing the villain Johnny Rancid, who was an original villain created for this series, and this was his first appearance. While he may look like the main man Lobo, there are other references at play as well. Much of his look and even his name are meant to hearken to punk rockers. His name is reminiscent of Sex Pistols lead singer Johnny Rotten, and he was voiced by Henry Rollins, who fronted the punk band Black Flag. You can't stop me. You can't even catch me. The encounter between him and Robin does not end well for the boy wonder. He crashes onto the suspension bridge that they're having this chase on, their motorbike showdown, which leads to our first Larry sighting, which is in the opening credits. He's meant to be having a bit of a fourth wall break moment, as it is made to appear that he is singing the theme song, which I cannot play for you, alas, but it's an amusing moment. It's sung with passionate, but not entirely melodic gusto, not by Dee Bradley Baker, who voices Larry in this episode, but by Toshiro Kai, who is Puffy Amy Yumi's producer. They were the ones who originally sang the theme, and they back him up and harmonize for a bit in this opening, and it's pretty great. Go look it up if you get the chance. Yes, YouTube will hurt me if I play it. Throughout this opening, you get to see Larry popping up across the screen or driving across it in what looks like how Batgirl would ride across the screen in the season three Batman 66 opening. Since Larry will be presented as a super fan of Robin, it's very fitting to have him sing the opening theme. It's a character appropriate touch because the Teen Titans theme, the original one, was much beloved by fans. The explosion Robin was in thankfully only hurt his arm and Raven has got down to a fracture, hence the title. In an atypical moment, Robin doesn't push back against the idea of staying behind and healing. You're not gonna be all crazy determined. And insist that you are fine when you clearly are not. And yell at us for trying to make you stay home. It's in this moment of oddness that Larry bursts forth from Robin's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Now it is said that this is a shout out to the Fooly Cooly anime, but when I first saw it as a youth, my mind left to Athena being birthed from the forehead of Zeus. I don't think it's a reference to that. Regardless, here's Larry. Right away, his appearance is similar to Batmite, who debuted in Detective Comics 267 in 1959. We did a whole video on his debut. I'll link it down below. He appeared dressed like the Dark Knight with a comical look as he was tiny and the costume had a droopy ear. In his initial outing, he came from another dimension. It wasn't specified which yet, but he proclaimed himself to be a big fan of Batman and that he was there to help. And 
he proceeded to be annoying. That might appear to have been inspired by Mr. Mr. Pitlick, who debuted in Superman 30 in 1944. He didn't initially appear as a Superman fan. He would grow into being a prankster who would really test Superman's patience. Larry has bits of both. The appearance is very Batmite, but modified for Robin, as he is a Boy Wonder fan. But his name, true name being Dick Grayson backwards, is a nod to how Superman would get rid of Mixie, which was to trick him into saying his name backwards. So those stories would be a bit of a chance for Superman to show off his super brains, not just his super strength. So the backwards name is a bit of an homage. Also, Larry, as he's dubbed by the Titans, insists he is a genetic match for Robin. And he is, they confirm this. And since his name is Dick Grayson, this is yet another subtle Easter egg and hint as to which Robin this is. There have been debates about over the years. Also, when he calls himself Mr. Larry as he celebrates his new name, he appears as a golden age rendition of Robin in a Dick Sprang-like art style. Larry saw Robin get hurt and he's here to help. And while he is annoying Robin, he's not especially put out by him because he's too involved in his own depression about feeling that he's keeping the team down. And that's much more at the forefront of his mind than Larry so the two of them don't really connect. One might expect him to have a bit more of a reaction than he does. Welcome to our universe, small amusing doppelganger. <laughs> but now Johnny Rancid is back. And it's never quite clear in the episode exactly what his deal is, at least not in this episode. He's just bad and on a motorbike and a threat that's worthy of all the Titans, apparently. Robin stays behind because he's presented as having been very shaken by his failure to capture Rancid the first time. His confidence is low because Robin is very aggressive in pursuing criminals in this series. It's very much his raison d'etre, so for him not to be doing that, it appears out of character, but it's meant to. It's meant to show that he's not okay. Now, Larry is said to hail from the fourth and nine eighths dimension. So almost the fifth dimension, which is where Mr. Mixie and Batmite are from. And he does have powers that seem to warp reality, but they're mostly localized in his finger. He's got a magic finger. And he's not the best at using his powers, as can be seen when he tries to fix Robin's arm and instead turns it into various items. At one point, an Ash Williams chainsaw arm. Groovy. Robin is wallowing. Hey. Wanna check in with the team on your communicator? They're fine. The two end up struggling because Larry won't stop trying to fix him and that results in his finger being shoved down and just going wild. He loses control of it and starts to warp all reality giant beam up in the sky spreading outward. The reality alteration is the most fun part of this episode. It's done in a kid's drawing style reminiscent of crayons, and you get a couple of wacky moments, like Beast Boy not having a mouth, so they have to swap mouths and hence voices. <laughs> Not a good idea. There's prolonged chase sequences. One has a giant dinosaur. Starfire's head floats away. Beast Boy gets a mouth, but he puts it on backwards, so he's speaking backwards for the rest of the episode. They really have fun with this segment. It's whimsical and slightly trippy shenanigans. <laughs> Johnny Rancid has somehow reasoned that if he hops into this beam, he'll be able to alter reality. And he does, and it's a punk style world with Batman Beyond-esque music, and Raven really likes it. Cool. Uh, I mean, oops. Robin is still very depressed. He doesn't feel like he can do anything. And this is where Larry gets his chance to shine and also have a bit of a different dynamic from Batmite or Mr. Mixie. He's gonna provide some moral support cheer Robin up and remind Robin why he's awesome because he needs that this episode. I mess up all the time, but I still try. That's how come you're my hero, Robin, because no matter what, you always try. This is a sweet moment. It's a bit contrived how it comes about, but it still tugs at your heartstrings. Robin's worry that he's a liability to the team isn't a bad concept, but it comes across as atypical to his usual attitude, particularly as there's no real attachment or threat level to assign Johnny Rancid since this is his first appearance. It's not linked to the other episodes either, so it's not as though it's presented as first the betrayal, now this. It's just this happened and now he's down for the count. It's clear from a structural perspective, Robin has to feel this way for Larry to function as a motivational element. Element. Otherwise, he would just be a very annoying imp. And for some, that's exactly what he is. Now, this is pre-Batman the Brave and the Bold, which would use Batmite to great effect, but Mix had been used in adaptations over in Super TAS. So perhaps the goal in this episode was to play with something different or just to present that Batmite concept and have him be a positive force for Robin and try and lean away from the quasi-villain adjacent depictions. Morale boosted, Larry gets to team up with Robin and they take down Johnny Rancid and turn the world back to normal. Everything looks so joyous and wonderful. Yeah, 
Any chance we could change it back? Larry fixes his arm, but in the process seems to send him to the nether sphere. The end. This episode is okay. It's not bad, but compared to the caliber of the other episodes in the series and even in this season, it's not the best. As for entirely isolated and on its own, it's mid. Larry often crosses the threshold from fun into annoying. We're still alive! For most of it, he's just kind of there, and the episode has to ride on how fun one finds it. And perhaps that could be very fun. Again, shout out to that kid's drawing sequence. It's a creative sequence that they have fun with, but at the same time, it also feels a bit like padding, like they're stretching to get to that moment where Robin regains his confidence, as if this idea didn't quite have enough meat to fill out the entire episode, or there weren't enough things to do with the altered reality to make it feel like it's moving faster than it is. Basically the idea that there wasn't enough Larry to fill an entire episode or ideas for him, and maybe he's better suited to a short, which we'll see later. As a filler episode, if a fills its function. But again, it's not overly notable or stand out. I dub the fractured aggressively mid for this series. There's also a bunch of animation errors involving Robin's arm and the cast. There are some sequences where it should be there that it's just not. It becomes a fun game, like Where's Waldo cast edition. Now Larry wouldn't fade away entirely. In the Teen Titans main series, he would have one more cameo. This in season three's X. When the Titans are trying to figure out who Red X is, Beast Boy suggests that maybe it's Larry and you get to see a blip of what that would look like. And he would be left alone on the television front until this very gag would be revisited in the new Teen Titans shorts, which were a series of more comedic style short episodes which ran from 2011 to 2012. In this series, the original cast reprised their roles. This series led to some fans hoping that a revival of the original Teen Titans was in the works, as some felt that there were more stories to tell and that the way that it ended left it open for more. However, what this led to instead was the creation of Teen Titans Go, which would continue on in this tone, although with a different art style. This is one of the things that would lead to such a vehement reaction against Go in some circles. Not all, some. And again, not the only one of. I like Go. I'm putting it out there. The reason why these shorts were so comedic in the first place was because that was already a strong element in the show. It's bigger than some give credit for or remember. Even in serious episodes, there can be moments where chipification or visual gags take over. And we are most mirthful to claim you as our friend. Yeah, what they say. Larry appears in two episodes of these shorts. First is Red X Unmasked, where he is one of the masks that is shown to potentially be Red X. One of the guesses is, interestingly enough, Jason Todd. They made more overt references to other things, other parts of lore in these shorts, which is something that would continue on and to go. The other short was Apprentice Part 3, which is just Larry living his life fantasizing about being Robin. The Titan signal! Robin. It's time you met my new apprentice. He has to take out Gizmo, Jinx, Mammoth, and then eventually Slade himself. <laughs> Larry Fair is better here overall. The tone suits him. The length is such that he doesn't wear at his welcome. It comes across like a fun pastiche. It sells the idea of Larry more than his first appearance did. But before those later animated appearances, Larry would already have made the jump onto the pages of comics in the Teen Titans tie-in comic called Teen Titans Go, which can be confusing as that is also the name of the tie-in comic for the Teen Titans Go series, which began in 2013. It's fine. Larry would first appear in the comics in issue 18 of the first Teen Titans Go comic series in 2005. He would appear in the issue called Chibi's Attack. It was written by Jay Torres and had art by Todd Nyack, inks Larry Strucker, Colors Heroic Aid Studios. The tie-in comic in general would expand upon concepts from the show and would run on past it, lasting till 2008 with 55 issues. In this issue, Larry unleashes chibi versions of the Titans, because when the world needs heroes who can joke, tween Titans go. <laughs> you weren't expecting a cringe attack. Always be prepared. Panels, turn the page. I see they're like us, but chibi versions, super deformed teen Titans, doppelgangers. I suppose sooner or later we were due a visit by someone from outer space, the future or another dimension. These are alternate versions of the Titans from a comic that Larry was reading. He sneezed on the page and he accidentally forced them into the Teen Titans universe. There are many shenanigans. Every time he sneezes, something happens. He accidentally makes the main Titans 2D. They have to fight a whole bunch of villains, chibi villains as well. Everyone is much more annoyed with Larry this time. And he once more struggles to put things right. The page where he ends up trying to fix them and zaps them to some kind of variant of a past comic appearance is pretty fun. Special shout outs to Starfire's big hair, Robin's OG shorts, and of course, Raven's goth shirt and her more Trigon look. I really like the shirt because it's also a reference to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a Jessica Rabbit quote. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. 
at the end, things seem to go pretty right, except there's a meta fourth wall break where we see that he accidentally sent the chibis to terrorize the comic writers. So Larry's now been positioned firmly as an incompetent Batmite, and also is canonically annoying. This continues in his next appearance, Stupid Cupid, from the year 2007. Same creative team, let's go. I'm in the mood for love, how about you? I'm scared. This is Larry's crazed shipper arc. And I'm not just saying that, they're making some commentaries in this. Inspired by Robin and Starfire officially being together, Larry decides that he wants to see what other Titans he should pair together. He just gets his dolls and starts smashing them together and decides that he should play Cupid, literally. And he does so with an outrageous French accent, because language of love and all that, and why not? The one and only. <laughs> and then he started blasting. One of the pairs is Red Arrow and Cheshire, which is a nod to the fact that in the main comics canon, they would get together and have a child, Leanne Harper. Things go awry. I mean, more awry than from base concept as he starts missing, like when he tries to shoot Kid Flash, but ends up shooting a bunch of women around him. We get to see poor Raven trying to undo everything, but she can't. And we see some of the pairs, Aqualad and the fish. Stop. Oh, uh, that's a reference to crack shipping, I know it is. Wonder Girl manages to put a stop to this all after Eros tells her what happened. The comic tie-ins featured more titans than the show did. And then this comic takes an actual jab at shippers. Yeah, no more shipping. It's rather pointless. Oh, come on now, comic. It was already inferred. We were having fun. Now it's crossed the line over into mean-spirited. Lightly mean-spirited. While some shippers can go too far, just like any part of the fandom, there's some great shipping fan fiction, fan art, theories, just communities out there. The problem arises when people try and impose their ships onto others, creators, the can itself and warp it, or otherwise cross boundaries. But the base act itself of, oh, these characters would work well together, or I like this concept, isn't so far removed from these characters should be on a team, or these two would win in a fight, or how the Hulk's pants stay on. It's just fans extrapolating on characters. It's that passion that makes them want to stay with them a while longer, to think about them in various ways. Also, sometimes it does end up impacting canon organically, not by forcing anything. Although it has at times been forced and that's never good. An example of that happening on this very show is BB Ray. Beast Boy and Raven. And that became a huge ship in the fandom because ships don't just have to be non-canonical. They can be things that are happening. And BB Ray has influenced both other adaptations and comics going forward. Funnily enough, BB Ray shippers did not have a good reputation in fandom at the time due to the aggressiveness of some louder members. But the ship itself wasn't born from nowhere. So the characterization of it just being people smashing dolls together while amusing isn't entirely accurate. But also there's a whole culture to shipping and crack ships, rare pairs, just a whole lot going on that if one isn't involved in it, it can be hard to fathom or want to fathom. But if it's your thing, there are good times to be had there. As with everything, moderation, boundaries, respect. Anyway, Larry was creepy this issue, but he's super sorry. But the annoyance level is veering towards menace. Now, Larry also has a brief cameo in issue 48, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. When Raven is opening portals, you see him behind one of them. He also appeared as Larry the Titan in an issue of Scooby-Doo Team Up. Issue three, which is digital issue six, because that was during the digital first era. This was 2014. So they were pushing digital releases, but then they would be released in actual trades, and because of the different formatting, it would alter the numbers a bit. Who remembers that era? In this issue, he's characterized as an imp from the fifth dimension. The story was two mites make it wrong, and the main plot is Batmite and Scooby Mite messing with Batman, Robin, and the Scooby gang. And once they've left, Larry appears briefly at the end for a womp womp, oh no, now we have to do it again moment. He's also appeared in a game. He's a power up in the first Teen Titans Go online game. It was hosted on Cartoon Network. It appeared shortly after the show began, this in 2013. It's Tower Lockdown a game where you play as Robin, who has to navigate the levels of Titan's Tower as it's locking down. Larry is a power-up, and with him, Robin could walk through electricity. And those are the Larry sightings, time of recording. Who knows, maybe now they're gonna do a big push for Larry. Some people feel that Night Might in Tom Taylor's Nightwing is a reference to Larry, and not just Batmite. As far as characters created for the Teen Titans went, while Larry stood out and did have repeat potential, he ultimately wasn't the strongest addition and is fairly derivative. He veered heavily towards annoying, though some jokes worked, but they were more environmental than around him himself. One last shout out to the crayon world. Good time. In terms of annoying Might style characters, he's fairly high up there. He doesn't resonate quite the same way against Robin as the other Mites do against their counterparts. Maybe it's just because of the state that Robin was in when he first appeared, but it doesn't quite have the same zing. He is certainly a strong contender for most annoying Robin. I think he takes the crown, but what do you think? 
I have lots more questions. Let's go. Do you disagree? Do you think that this is a very strong episode? Or is it just one of your faves? Do you think that Johnny Rancid looks like Akuma when he transforms? People say that he does. I don't know if I see it fully. Which Titans did you ship, if any? Share your thoughts down below. And while you're down there, please follow YouTube things. Like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this night I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. And I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.